Today I'll be giving a demonstration of the diabetic foot exam. The term diabetic foot refers to a constellation of physical findings and medical complications in the foot arising as a consequence of impaired sensation due to diabetic neuropathy, impaired blood supply due to concurrent peripheral vascular disease, impaired wound healing and secondary infections due to the relative immunosuppression of diabetes, and last, impaired mobility in the chronically ill diabetic, which prevents him or her from routinely inspecting and caring for his or her own, own feet. The diabetic foot is one of the most common causes of hospital admissions for diabetics and the leading cause of amputations in the United States. Predictors of future need for amputation include prior amputation, foot ulceration, impaired arterial supply, high hemoglobin A1C, physical deformity, and neuropathy. There are three major components of the diabetic foot exam. They are inspection, assessment of arterial supply, and assessment of neurologic function. Hello, Ms. Park. My name is Eric Strong. I'm going to be performing the diabetic foot exam on you today as a demonstration for some of our trainees. Do you have any questions? As with most examinations, you should begin the diabetic foot exam with inspection with both legs exposed to above the knees. Look for prior amputations and assess for general foot hygiene. Look for dryness and cracking of the feet, superficial fungal infections, and good nail care. Inadequate hygiene is a risk factor for developing infections. Even mild skin cracking or a superficial fungal infection could serve as a potential portal of entry for more serious bacterial infections. Assess the hair pattern. An asymmetric absence of hair or abrupt change in hair pattern as one moves distally down a leg suggests arterial insufficiency. Look for calluses, which may be a sign of improperly fitting footwear and may precede ulcer development. Alterations may be due not just to repeated trauma, but also arterial insufficiency due to concurrent peripheral vascular disease or from concurrent venous stasis. And the presence of an ulcer does not necessarily indicate infection. Signs of infection include surrounding erythema, tenderness, and purulent drainage. Osteomyelitis is likely if either bone is visible within the ulceration or if the bone can be reached by examining the ulcer with a sterile probe. Also inspect for joint deformities. These include metatarsal subluxation, which is usually seen with the first MTP joint. The first MTP joint can be vertically subluxed or more commonly laterally subluxed, which creates a pressure point on the joint's medial surface. This is what is known as a bunion and is formally referred to as hallux abducto valgus deformity. Bunions are not caused by diabetes per se, but can complicate the treatment of the diabetic foot. Another pair of related deformities are the claw toe and hammer toe, which are due to combinations of vertical subluxations of the MTP, PIP, and DIP joints, which often happens to toes 2 through 5 simultaneously. The more dramatic deformity seen in diabetes is called neuropathic arthropathy, or more commonly the Charcot foot, which is a pattern of destructive changes due to repetitive trauma to insensate joints. Early features include edema, warmth, and erythema surrounding affected joints. Later features include overt joint deformity, joint dislocations, pathologic fractures, and overlying skin ulcerations. Neuropathic arthropathy is not specific for diabetes, as it's also seen in other etiologies of peripheral neuropathy, including alcoholism, HIV, and syphilis. The most extreme form of Charcot foot is the so-called rocker bottom foot deformity, in which the normal arch of the foot becomes everted, leading to a dangerous pressure point in the midfoot. Before leaving inspection, be sure to examine the patient's footwear. Abnormal patterns of wear may suggest improperly fitting shoes and or an abnormal gait, which can be an early sign of neuropathic arthropathy. The next part of the exam is an assessment of the vascular supply. This begins with checking the temperature in the legs, ensuring that they are equally warm. At this point, the formal diabetic foot exam would also assess capillary refill, in which the nail of the great toe is compressed and the time to reperfuse the nail bed is measured. 
However, this exam finding has been demonstrated in the literature to be of little value in assessing for peripheral vascular disease, which is consistent with my own personal experience, and thus I omit it. Then we check the peripheral pulses. Always start assessment of pulses as distally as possible, and only bother with more proximal pulses if the distal ones are abnormal. The most distal pulses in the leg are first the dorsalis pedis pulse, which is found just lateral to the extensor tendon of the great toe, and second, the posterior tibial pulse, which is found posterior and inferior to the medial malleolus. In the event that either of these is abnormal, you should follow it with assessment of the popliteal pulse. This is found in the midline within the popliteal fossa behind the knee and is best felt with a hand wrapped around the knee from the front and pressure applied while the knee is relaxed in moderate flexion. When it comes time to describe the strength of a patient's pulse, despite occasional insistence to the contrary, there is no specific standardized numerical scale to use. Therefore, pulses are best described qualitatively as absent, present but diminished, normal, or bounding. Any abnormalities that suggest the presence of peripheral vascular disease should be further investigated with measurement of the ankle brachial index. The last of the three main sections of the diabetic foot exam is assessment of neurologic function, beginning with sensation. Ms. Park, I'm next going to evaluate vibration sense in your feet with this tuning fork. Can you hold your arm out? And can you feel that? Yes. And do you feel it stopped? Yes. Okay, I'm going to check the same thing in your feet now with your eyes closed. Okay. All right, so let me know when you can feel the vibration, and then let me know when you can no longer feel it. Okay. Yes. It's gone. All right, on the other side? Yes. It's gone. Ms. Park, next, with your eyes closed, I'm going to lift your great toe, uh, either up or down, and I want you to tell me which direction you think it's being moved. Okay. Up. Down. Down. Up. On the other side? Up, up, down, up. Great. The sensory exam typically ends with a monofilament test. In the conventional monofilament test, the patient lies supine with eyes closed while the examiner touches various points on both feet with the monofilament using enough pressure to cause it to buckle. The patient indicates when he or she feels the monofilament touching them. Despite some claims to the contrary, as with a pulse scale, there is no one standard as to the specific spots on the foot where the patient should be touched. However, a reasonable list of locations would include the plantar surfaces of the first and fifth toe and of the first and fifth MTP joints, plus or minus the center of the heel. The test is generally considered to be abnormal if the patient is unable to feel the sensation at any one site. The conventional monofilament used in this test is called the 5.07 monofilament, which defines the amount of force the monofilament imparts to the skin before it buckles. Ms. Park, with your eyes closed, I'd like you to tell me when you feel this monofilament touching the bottom of your foot. Yes. 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 All right, great, thank you. Some clinicians also include assessment of pain by randomly touching different parts of the foot with either the sharp or dull side of a broken cotton-tipped applicator or tongue depressor. 
If the prior sensory modalities are normal and the patient has no sensory complaints, I personally omit this section as well. The next component of the foot-focused neuro exam is a check of the ankle reflex. This is most commonly done with a patient sitting upright, but anyone who has actually attempted to elicit this reflex in this position can appreciate it is awkward and difficult to perform. Therefore, I advise checking the ankle reflex with the patient supine, with the hip externally rotated, knee flexed, and ankle in mild dorsiflexion in order to stretch the Achilles tendon. The final component of the exam is assessment of gait. It should be assessed for smoothness and symmetry. Gait abnormalities may be indicative of neuropathy and or early neuropathic arthropathy. Well, Ms. Park, that's the, the end of the exam. And I just want to let you know everything was healthy and normal. Thank you. That concludes this video on the diabetic foot exam. I hope you found it interesting and useful.